On behalf of NCJWAB, I would like to thank them for their continued support of this annual lecture and for the work in, their org in the organisation over many years. My name is Rebecca Davis. I'm Features Editor and News Journalist at the Australian Jewish News. And tonight, it gives me great pleasure to be your host. We're glad you can join us for this exciting event. So please make yourself comfortable, get a cup of tea or something stronger if you prefer, <laughs> and get ready to hear from our inspiring speakers. We hope you enjoy this different format and we're glad we can still connect even though this isn't in person during these very unusual times. Tonight, we're delighted to have the late Minna Fink's grandson, Mark Regev, joining us from Israel to share in his grandmother's legacy and their family connection to Israel. Mark has had 30 years of experience in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where he's played a key role representing the State of Israel. He served as Israel's ambassador to the United Kingdom from 2016 to 2020. And before that, was the Prime Minister's advisor and international spokesperson for over eight years. Mark established himself as one of Israel's most recognised voices across the English-speaking world. Over to you, Mark. Thank you for that introduction. And I'd like to say thank you to the National Council of Jewish Women for bringing us all together. It is appreciated. Now, these Minna Fink annual lectures have been going on for, I understand, some 10 years. And this is the first time I've been able to participate from Israel because we're doing it online. We're doing it through Zoom. So maybe my grandmother would have said that in every crisis, in every moment of darkness, there is a silver lining. There is something positive. And this coronavirus, this terrible pandemic, has allowed me for the first time to be part of this lecture because I don't think you've ever done it on Zoom before. I know other members of my family have given the introductory remarks before. This is the first time I'm doing so, and I, I'd like to thank the National Council for inviting me and helping to make this happen. You know, growing up in Australia, Minna Fink was my grandmother, and so she was special because she was my grandmother. And I can tell you, as a child, I probably wasn't aware at all of all the things that she was doing in public life for the community. Uh, all the various humanitarian projects and social projects that she was very much involved in. She was special not because of her public activities, she was special because she was my grandmother. And never ever did me or my siblings or the other grandchildren feel that because Minna was so involved in public affairs that we suffered, that our grandmother wasn't there for us when we needed her. And I think that's also an important part of her legacy, her contribution, her presence in our family, her effect, her effect on all our lives, and maybe more about that later. When I think about uh, Minna Fink, my grandmother, uh, I'd like to talk briefly about uh, two things, uh, two ways which I think we should try to understand what sort of person she was and what was important uh, for her. She married my grandfather, Leo, uh, in Bialystok, Poland in 1932. And uh, obviously, uh, their marriage lasted decades. But ultimately, if one thinks about it, in many ways, Leo saved her life. Because had Minna not married Leo, had she not emigrated to Australia then in the 1930s, she would have most likely remained behind in Bialystok and been murdered uh, uh, like all the other Jews who remained there. I mean, ultimately, at the beginning of the Second World War, there were some 50,000 Jews living in Bialystok, Poland. At the end of the war, there were barely a few hundred. And Minna, no doubt, saw herself as a survivor of the Holocaust. And only by luck, by chance, did, was she not left behind there to be murdered by the Nazis. And I think that helped explains Minna's activism her dynamism in, in supporting uh, uh, Holocaust survivors, in supporting the refugees. In fact, when the war was still going on in the 1940s, she was very, very active already then in supporting uh, uh, overseas relief uh, for Jews. Uh, she was active in sending financial support, foodstuffs, medicine, clothing to support people who could be reached. And of course, after the war, we all know of Minna's legacy in helping refugees from the Holocaust reach Australia. And they had to lobby the government 
because not everyone in the Australian government wanted Jews to immigrate to Australia. And of course, she was very proactive in helping refugees come, especially orphans. She herself was an orphan. And of course, the war produced many young Jewish orphans. And she personally did her best to meet them when they arrived, to look after them when they, when they, uh, when they settled, uh, uh, to, to worry about accommodation, to worry about social affairs, to make sure that they had training and professional advice and so forth. Uh, and there's no doubt that Minna knew that she could have been one of them. She could have been killed like their families in the Holocaust. And I think that explains an important part of her legacy and her, her involvement then in overseas relief led to her support for Jewish welfare and what is today Jewish care. These are things that were very important for Minna because that was part of her. That was part of her experience. That was part of her life. She knew how many people that she knew in Bialystok didn't survive the war, and she knew how important it was to support the survivors. I remember I went to Mount Scopus College, uh, and, and uh, friends of mine would sometimes come up to me and say, oh, my father or my mother knows your grandmother. And those, they, they were the children of war orphans that my grandmother had gone and looked after in a very hands-on way, becoming surrogate family for those war orphans. But that's only one part of her legacy, and there are many, many other parts. And because I'm here in Jerusalem, uh, I thought I'd, I'd like to talk about Minna and Zionism, Minna and Israel, which is also, I think, a crucial part of her legacy. Uh, you know, in the early 1960s, uh, Leo and Minna came to, to Israel to set up a factory, uh, a woolen, woolen industries, Australian woolen industries, they were called, in southern Israel, in Ashdod. And the, the concept was that instead of the young Jewish state receiving charity from Jewish communities around the world, that Jewish communities around the world should actually support Israel in, in diversifying and expanding its industrial base. And here was an, a hands-on effort by Leo and Minna to see what they could do to provide jobs, to provide uh, uh, economic uh, uh, prowess to the young state of Israel. And that was a very important project. It was one of the first of its kind. And once again, the goal was that Israel shouldn't live off charity. Israel should live off its own economic prowess and help create an industrial infrastructure in the new Jewish state. Uh, Minna once said that that was one of the proudest moments of her life when they opened that factory in Eshdod. And after my grandfather Leo passed away in 1972, Minna actually lived for an extended period of time here in Israel and was very proud. I remember visiting her as a teenager. She attended an upan to get her Hebrew up to scratch. And she was very much involved in social life here in Jerusalem. I remember me and my sister Lillian visiting her flat in Kiryat Wolfson, which has this wonderful view from the balcony of the Jerusalem skyline. And you can see from that apartment, uh, you could see the Knesset and you could see the, the, uh, the Israel Museum and the, and the parks between the Saka Park and others. And even in the corner, you could see uh, uh, the prime minister's office. Uh, which is where I ended up working. And I have no doubt uh, that at the time, uh, looking at the view, I didn't think, oh, one day I'll be working there. But I also have no doubt that Minna influenced me as she influenced so many, many others in a good way. Uh, that Minna influenced me and the, the path that I chose of, 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 of uh, working in, in, in the public sphere, uh, of, of, of trying to do something that was bigger than myself, that was, that was part of her legacy. And as I said, she touched my life, she touched all my siblings and the other grandchildren, and, and she will always be remembered as a loving grandmother, but also as a woman who really left an impact on, on, on the community, on the country, on the planet. And for that, we all thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was the most insightful recollection of your grandmother, what a wonderful woman. And our good fortune to have you via Zoom. So thank you for joining us. I'm now very excited to introduce our guest speaker for this year's Minna Fink Lecture. Umzili Mlambo Nuka is the UN Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Women, positions she has held since August 2013. Umzili served as Deputy President of South Africa from 2005 to 2008, before which time she held ministerial positions and was a Member of Parliament. Focusing on human rights, equality, and social justice, 
Bumzili began her career as a teacher, gaining international experience at the World YWCA. She is also the founder of Umlambo Foundation, supporting leadership and education. A longtime champion of women's rights, Pumzili is affiliated with several organisations devoted to women, education and gender equality. Today, we'll be hearing about her incredible life journey and how education is the linchpin in gender equality. Before beginning my in-depth conversation with Pumzili, I should mention that you have the opportunity to ask questions at the end. So please send through any that you may have using the Zoom Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I thank you to those who've already pre-registered their questions. Hello, Pumzili. <laughs> Lovely to have you here with us tonight. Thank you so much for having me and uh, good evening to everybody there. Well, it's morning in South Africa. Mm. <laughs> I'm sure a little warmer than here. It's a freezing cold night in Melbourne tonight. <laughs> um, so before we get into the issues at hand, I'd like to go way back in your story. Um, to understand a little bit more about you and your early years and what inspired your passion for improving the status of women. Well, um, thank you so much uh, for that uh, question. Um, I actually became part of YWCA as a teenager, uh, in part because my mother was a, a member and uh, it was something that uh, was uh, in the family. The YWCA was a, a women's organization and with a, a, a youth part, we were called Youth Teens. Uh, it was a, a, an international organization which helped me to get a global perspective from its work. We worked in the community a lot and a lot that we did had to do with education because the education system in South Africa at the time uh, discriminated against black people. So there was always work to do to cover the gap. And that introduced me both to service and to organization at a young age. And I think uh, the moral of the story just from that part uh, for young people is that it is so important to be part of something as a young woman. Girl guides, a Sunday school, a community activity, because I, bet, I think that is what in many ways shapes who we become as adults. Mm -hmm. So just coming into the, the topic today, um, there are obviously a whole variety of factors that contribute to gender equality. But can you share your thoughts on the element of education and its centrality to this conversation? Yes. Um, well, uh, one of the important things to say is that uh, right now, uh, at, the, and at, the, at the height of lockdown, there were a lot, like, about 1.6 billion uh, school going children who were not at school. Uh, and as for UNESCO, uh, it is really unprecedented. 1.6 uh, billion. Billion, wow. yes. Yeah. So, uh, and for those uh, who are parents with young children, um, I think uh, if the doctors don't find the vaccine, the parents were going to find the vaccine because of <laughs> the lot of work they had to do. They had to be teachers themselves with mm. this something they were ready for. So they really needed a, a, a solution to make the children's life normal and society's life to be normal. But, you know, girls' education in particular is critical. It's probably the closest thing to a silver bullet. Uh, because once girls are educated, they are able to take care of themselves when they have families, they are able to take care of their families. They contribute to communities. Girls who are in school are uh, also protected from the diseases uh, such as HIV and AIDS, from early pregnancy. In many countries, education is actually the one thing that stops early marriage and has helped government to promote the laws 
to make early marriage and forced marriage illegal because parents can actually see that an educated girl is able to fight poverty. It is not a girl who has a husband when she is young who becomes uh, less poor. In fact, she becomes poor if she marries early. So education has so much uh, to give uh, to, to, to society. So for me, it, if it, there was one thing I would wish for every girl and for every child for that matter, is that they are able to have their education at the very least to finish high school because that already helps them to have some, cho some, some choices. Obviously, we want them to go even further, but just for, for them to be able to finish their unschool uninterrupted uh, would be something that would be a blessing if we could give every child in the world that opportunity. Mm. And how do you overcome that, I guess, that cycle, that societal norm where you know young girls are expected to get married young maybe don't have you know they've got that pressure from uh, family to not not study get married um, and so the cycle of poverty continues how, how do you actually break that well um, as we know uh, we say in africa it takes a village to bring up a child it certainly takes a, a village to institutionalize the norms that appreciate investments uh, in girls. Uh, it is not just the family uh, that uh, we need to make sure that we win over. And as UN women and other UN agencies, we work a lot in communities with mothers because of the role that they play. Something that we've historically neglected is working with fathers and men mm -hmm. uh, in society. Something that we are now doing a lot of because they are needed in this uh, equation, both as uh, parents and influencers and people who often hold authority in communities. We are working with traditional chiefs. We are working with the uh, religious leaders, whatever the religion uh, in that community. Uh, we make sure that the people in that religion are, are also uh, in on believing in girls and in, in, in supporting girls. And of course, we need governments to also be vigilant mm. uh, about paying attention to girls' uh, education. Uh, you need to make sure that public education functions because at the end of the day, the largest number of people who are poor and girls who will drop out of school can only be saved if you have a functioning public system because it is then accessible and affordable uh, to all, mm. including providing a meal <laughs> at school because <laughs> Some children, uh, they go to school because that is where they get a meal. Mm. Whatever it is that will send a child to school, let's do it. If it means that a meal will send, will make them come to school, if it means that when you give her a bag of rice to take home mm. for her family, her family will let her come to school because she's going to bring her a bag of rice, let it be but mm. everything we can do, we have to try. Absolutely. I'm glad you touched on school itself. Um, the UN Women has observed inequality around education is broader than access to it, illuminating that violence against women and girls can take place on the way to school or within educational institutions. Um, in one report in the US, in fact, 83%, 83% of girls in years eight to 11 have experienced some form of sexual harassment in public schools. So what if have uh, UN women made ensuring safer educational institutions for girls themselves? Yeah, we have a, a coordinated uh, efforts that involves uh, UN women, uh, UNICEF, UNESCO, uh, and works with ministries of uh, education mm -hmm. uh, about guidelines. And 
the minimum conditions that should uh, exist in every school to guarantee protection uh, of children. And that is also part of extending the Convention of the Rights of a Child, which also requires nations, governments, and those of us who are uh, caregivers to children, either as teachers or uh, anyone who is in authority, uh, to make sure that uh, girls uh, are, are safe. Um, we also see that uh, in, 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 in many countries, uh, girls also walk to school. Mm. Uh, that is also uh, it, it dangerous. It's it, in, in some situations, uh, we raise that and flag with schools as something that needs to be given uh, attention where there is no possibilities for girls to walk to schools. They should at least walk in groups. Mm. Uh, in some communities, they are accompanied by adults. So there is almost, like families take turns to walk the girls to schools and to bring them back. And of course, there's, there are just sometimes just some hazards from having to cross a river uh, in order to go to school. And you just feel, you know, going to school should not be a heroic act mm, for a child every day. It should be as normal as possible. And one of the biggest a opportunity that the COVID crisis uh, brings to us is having to build back better, a better society where these kinds of problems that still affect so many children should be addressed and we should put them aside and move on to new, there'll always be new problems, but they are these problems water, sanitation, uh, uh, access to school, uh, transportation, the protection of, 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 of girls, access to digital goods and infrastructure. These are some of the things in the 21st century that are just basic. That, uh, and I don't think that governments uh, will be able to do this alone. So all of us are needed, private sector, women's organizations like <laughs> yourself, uh, the UN, young people, everybody uh, uh, is actually needed because the problem is so big. Mm. It takes a village, as you say. Takes a village. <laughs> <laughs> so just moving a little broader beyond education at the moment, what do you perceive as some of the greatest challenges facing women and girls today? Um, Certainly, uh, uh, violence is a problem if mm. you just consider the number of girls who experience uh, and have experienced uh, uh, violence. The fact that uh, perpetrators uh, um, get away uh, with it, they don't uh, have to deal uh, with the might uh, of the law in, 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 in most countries, even in countries where uh, there are good laws, uh, it's still difficult to implement those laws uh, uh, fully. Then also uh, education, obviously, as we have uh, spoken is important, and um, uh, economic empowerment is critical for girls uh, and women because they become productive citizens, they contribute and they are able to uh, look uh, after themselves. Uh, so in the work uh, that, that we do, which is a lot uh, uh, about policy, UN Women uh, is, is less about being an implementing organization. We influence the, the organizations who are the major in, implementers to do the things that uh, are needed uh, by, by women and girls. I suppose uh, if uh, um, I, I, I was uh, someone who had uh, met uh, men, I think he would have been one of the persons that we would have said, please go and implement this and that for girls as someone who had a, who had a passion for doing things uh, for, 
for, for society. So we influence policies uh, in countries. Uh, uh, for instance, we now, we've made sure that uh, as many countries as we possibly can, and I'm still going on, have laws uh, that criminalizes violence against women, including domestic violence. Uh, it's been a, quite a, a heavy lift. We're still left with 44 countries who have dodgy laws that we still have to make sure. But most of the countries now have the laws and all of us have to work to make sure those, those laws are, are implemented. We work uh, also with the uh, countries to make sure that uh, there is no discrimination of girls when it comes to education. That probably has been one of the biggest success of the last 25 years. And that is why we do want to make sure that after COVID, go, girls go back to school because mm. it's actually taken us this long to reach a point where in most countries, uh, it is almost, uh, it, 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 we still have girl countries where not all girls go to school, where too many children fall between the cracks, uh, but it's not out of lack of trying of countries. There's now a culture, it is in the mainstream to make sure that girls uh, go, go, go to school and that they stay at, at school as long uh, as, as, as possible. So we don't want to lose them. At this point, because of COVID, we have to make sure that every department of education must account for its girls when the schools reopen. Mm -hmm. uh, it is through that that girls will be able to get economic uh, empowerment. UN Women also works on second chance education because uh, many girls obviously will, would have dropped out for all kinds of reasons. And if a girl drops out, uh, in their teen years, this is a long life that is ahead of them for them to have their life cut short at that point. So, and they may be too old to go uh, to a normal school by the time they are ready to, but fortunately you are never too old to learn anyway. Right. So we then uh, uh, work a lot. Civil society is very important. Uh, religious and faith-based institutions are very important for providing a, a non-formal but uh, skills-oriented education that helps you to transit to the world of work. And I think, again, after COVID, we all are going to have to be thinking outside the box um, mm -hmm. about how we're going to make sure that we pick up the people whose jobs will never return women are likely to be in the majority uh, of those people who in, 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 in those positions. In developing countries, most of the women are in the informal sector. Uh, so when they lose whatever is, is their core assets, which may be a, a box of tomato uh, together with a stall and all and look, they're just putting that together, is a major expense uh, for them. So they need to start all over again. But then we need to equip them for the world that is coming because the future of work is going to be different. We need to make sure we help them to become digital natives in their own right so that they've got new and better choices uh, in their lives uh, uh, going forward. So it's almost like we are having to start the world all over. Uh, uh, again and I think we should embrace that as an opportunity uh, for us to do good and uh, do the best that we can in our small and those who can do it in a big way they can also do it in a big way. Mm -hmm. I think that leads nicely into my next question which as Executive Director of UN Women how have you observed COVID-19 to be impacting women in different parts of the world? I'm sure there'd be variations as to how um, women have been impacted and I guess the gender specific challenges that it's created for them. Yeah. You know, every pandemic has a gender dimension. Mm. Um, and this pandemic is not different. Uh, Ebola had a, a, a gender dimension. Zika had a, a gender dimension and COVID-19 also has a gender dimension. 
And the impact on women and girls of these pandemics is not just uh, the effect of the disease, the effect of being sick. It's the, the management of the response. Uh, it's also the exposure and the exacerbation of the underlying inequalities that they generally live with. Uh, and in the context of uh, COVID-19, uh, governments uh, uh, promoted a lockdown in order to uh, arrest the spread of the disease. Uh, the unintended consequence of those was that many women ended up being locked in with their mm. abuser, mm. Uh, with limited opportunity to have access to help. Uh, we then had to be engaging with governments about creating pathways for women to uh, 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 get away from uh, that situation or for help to come in to, to save women. We've called on governments to have uh, all the services that are needed by women affected uh, by, by violence uh, declared uh, uh, essential services. So if in Victoria or in Australia, you feel you don't have that, uh, I'm, I'm asking you to be uh, my loud speaker. I'm sure I know that you and women in Australia who are very active are, very, are paying attention to this, to this issue. The second thing that has affected uh, women a lot has been the women in the front lines. Mm. Uh, as you know, the majority of health workers are, are women. 85% of nurses are women who have been in the core uh, uh, of the teams that have been uh, and working there. They, the, the rate of infection on women, work health workers, has been much higher. In Italy, for instance, as high as 70% of health workers who have died uh, were women. Mm. And this is not uh, obviously the professional ones. Women are cleaners, uh, they are cooks in the, in the hospitals. And in the, at the height of the pandemic in many countries where there was a struggle for PPE, those would be the people who would be uh, shortchanged. And as we know, this disease is so uh, sneaky. Mm. Uh, you can just never be too careful That's so right. we we did lose um, a, a lot of people so women and then the burden of care uh, has been a big issue for women it, it, at this time because many people were not going to hospital when they were sick to do health care either because they were overburdened or because they didn't feel safe and when they stayed at home it meant that women had to become had, had to subsidize, subsidize for the healthcare by looking after six people, sick people, and women and girls. 11 year, eleven year old girl would have to be looking after their grandmother or their aunt, and sometimes when the mother still has to go out and settle. So we've seen the burden of care on the women increasing, and this is the invisible support that women do that is unpaid, which they provide to the community and the economy all the time. And one of our calls now as governments are coming up with fiscal stimulus is that you have to recognize the service, uh, redistribute it in some way, uh, remunerate, remunerate it uh, um, as well. But building back better in the long term means that we build infrastructure so that people who need care can be in the hands of professionals, not be uh, only taken care of. They are families who may not be well equipped. It's, and children in particular, uh, just childcare services uh, are a critical uh, uh, infrastructure that is needed. So when we talk about infrastructure that is responding to rebuild after COVID. These are some of the things we want to highlight. We don't want to end up with the countries thinking about building bridges, you know, the, the, the usual infrastructure 
uh, that has to do with the, if you like, a, 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 an eye of a macroeconomist who, who have a, no gender lens. We have to look at these things that make women's lives livable as well to complete the cycle of a good society. Mm, full picture. Yeah. Yeah. Just changing tact a little bit now. Um, in recent times, we've obviously seen movements such as Me Too and Black Lives Matter take centre stage. With intersectional feminism exploring the overlapping of these identity experiences of discrimination. I'm curious, as a woman and a woman of colour who's held prominent positions um, in leadership and, and politics, have you personally experienced sexism and racism? And if so, how have you overcome this? What are your thoughts on creating a more equal and inclusive future? Big question. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but, You know, uh, racism, uh, just like uh, gender inequality, is part of your identity everywhere you go. This is what you cannot hide because this is what people see you for. So for people who are racist or sexist, uh, just by looking at you uh, without having to say or do anything, uh, their racial prejudice uh, uh, kicks in. Mm. Uh, and uh, it has no uh, class, uh, your success or your being in a really high post does not mean that uh, you escape a racist uh, 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 attitude. I mean, uh, I think for me, one of the heights of racism and sexism together was when I was deputy president and you go to really important meetings and really important meetings, including uh, the meetings that uh, sometimes I would be representing uh, the president, I would be the acting president for the country. You gather into gatherings and usually the other, your counterparts are men. Mm. Um, and I didn't, I, I, I was the woman and my spouse was the man. And I would have people coming to suggest to me that uh, maybe I, I may want to join their wives. Uh, and not represent uh, my country in the table that uh, I am here to do. So how uh, do you handle that? You know, you know well, I'm, I'm just telling them that uh, I have a spouse. Uh, he, if he's interested, he can do that. Uh, I have a job to do here. <laughs> and my job is not to socialize with spouses, but uh, I, I, I would really like to... To greet that because I also don't want to make sure I don't belittle uh, those women. Mm, mm. Uh, and I also make sure that my place is not in in, in any way being uh, being replaced. And of course, you also have to know your staff most of the time when you are a black and a woman, mm. uh, because it is absolutely important to continuously add value. You sit there on your edge, wanting to make sure that you grasp everything that happens and that you make a contribution so that no one treats you as a Cinderella uh, sitting at the table. And, 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 and you deal with the difficult questions that are, are, are brought up behind you. So you would have people having a conversation almost amongst themselves as if you are not part of that conversation. So you have to budge in. Uh, you, you know, and make sure that your voice uh, uh, is heard. It's very important, I think, for us uh, as, as, as women, women of color or women in general, to always make sure that we own the space mm. and we don't seek permission and we get into the space, we do the job that we, we have to do and that we always go there well prepared, both uh, for people to to try and 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 deny us the space, or to be ignored. So just make sure that you go there prepared. That people must know that 
you have been there, you must not be a footnote of history. You must be present wherever you are. Mm, some great advice there. Um, as individuals, what do you think are some of the best ways that we can support over here in Australia? How can we support and engage younger generations of women, both in our own communities, but also in communities that are struggling around the world where women are particularly oppressed? Yeah, well, you know, solidarity remains one of the most uh, important value for us as a humanity. Uh, one thing that we've learned from COVID-19 uh, uh, is that we are one humanity. Mm. Uh, this disease has showed us that a virus anywhere is a virus everywhere. So we have to seek solutions that will work for everybody. If we have a vaccine, this must be a vaccine that will help everybody because we have to make sure that we defeat this disease everywhere um, it is. So that's, so that's the first step that we must be ready and, uh, and our paradigm must be that of solidarity and, and wanting uh, to work together. Uh, it is important that uh, we take the issues, Black, Black Lives Matter is everybody's business, uh, is also uh, extends to indigenous people in the context of Australia to stand up and fight for. But also we have to make sure that uh, black people, indigenous people are their own spokespersons uh, as much as possible. It is important that uh, uh, people who are affected by the uh, discrimination have the space to own uh, their own voices, their own destiny, and to feel supported uh, in doing that. It's important that white women don't speak for black women. Mm -hmm. uh, don't take away their voices. Don't feel they have to be in the leadership in all of the organizations that uh, are feminist and include black, black and white women. Shared space is important. And diversity does not mean just you just have people of different colors. It means that you have got people who are diverse, inclusive, and own power together. Uh, uh, so diversity is indeed about making sure that uh, the, uh, the, the, the decision making, the power also lies in the authority of those the struggle is being fought on their behalf. And uh, that takes a lot of uh, almost depth of sisterhood, uh, if, 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 if you know what I'm saying, so that you are able to have these conversations very honestly and very uncomfortably. And it is in that time when there's a discomfort that true change happens and you find each other and you walk forward uh, together. And I have seen it happened in the context of uh, South Africa where there were times when we needed to make sure that uh, black people are the ones that are speaking for themselves. But at the same time that you maintain solidarity, you don't make other people feel excluded in the struggle for humanity that they also care about. Mm -hmm. Just one final question, and this is a really quick one because we're going to move on now to our Q&A. So this is going to be tricky because you've only got a sentence or two. I'll give you two to answer this. <laughs> when we talk big dreams and the time comes, a long time hopefully, where you decide you're ready to walk away from UN Women, what is it that you would have hoped to achieve? What's the ultimate goal in just a sentence or two? Well, you know, I would love to see that the gender struggle is not a woman's business. Mm. That this is an issue that is owned by everybody. Uh, that the work for gender equality is done by the CEOs of companies, uh, by heads of states, not just the woman, the minister for gender who has usually a very small budget, uh, that the Minister of Police is made accountable for the crimes committed against women and is able to account and sees that as their key part, as the key part 
of their job and their terms of, 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 of reference, uh, that it's, it, the issue does not arise in the room because you and me are there. Mm. Uh, everybody understands the importance of making sure that uh, you, you have gender equality. And oh my God, pay, equal pay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we win this battle. I know it will not be won within my time while I'm in the UN, but I am putting it and investing everything that we can to make sure that this is a fight that we continue to fight and hopefully to win at mm -hmm. some point. Yeah, amen. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, moving into our Q&A now. Um, I could talk to you all night, so <laughs> I'm not going to hog the conversation <laughs> anymore. Um, we have Shindia who has asked, should women cautiously choose their field of work or career? Should women co co consciously get into fields where women are underrepresented? We have more teachers who are women than lawyers. Should we do something about it? Absolutely. Um, I think that uh, uh, as the uh, people that are concerned about these issues of equality, we need to promote uh, uh, these dialogues so that uh, women are not just making these decisions uh, alone, lonely, without the support uh, to make these decisions so that also when they get into the field, uh, there is a support system for, for them to be there. You need just as many women lawyers, women bankers, women engineers, as much as you need the male social workers, men in the humanities, uh, so that uh, we can have uh, men and women everywhere. You know, when we talk about gender studies in many universities, it has tended to be women learning about how bad patriarchy is, something they already know because they've lived it. Uh, gender studies, in my view, we, has to be something that we get just as many men uh, to learn about how we get over toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm. uh, it must not be, uh, gender studies must not just be about teaching about feminism, it must also be to teach about masculinity, both in its worst and in its, at its, and its best and finding solutions for that. Uh, yeah, so yes, spaces where women and men are not, this is our responsibility to fix that. Mm. Another question here from Julie Riley. Um, it's quite a long one, so I'll just cut through it a little bit. We are seeing mainstream discussion about the gendered impacts of COVID-19 economically and socially, which you've touched on. What are your thoughts on how to best take this opportunity to press for gender lens budgeting by governments and gender lens philanthropy for private funders to invest in women and girls and advance gender equality? Yeah. Um, it, it, exactly the thing that, uh, again, I'm hoping that uh, you also join the club and be the megaphone for these ideas. The fiscal stimulus that governments are using now, because a lot of governments are going to have a very uh, decreased fiscal space after COVID because they've had to spend so much money uh, responding to COVID. It is important that the COVID funding is gender responsive, mm. that uh, is targeted to the needs of, 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 of women, uh, because this is something that we're going to be dealing with for a long time. Uh, women cannot afford to miss the boat this time. Uh, so part of our engagement now with ministers of finance, uh, with the uh, uh, advocates for gender equality, uh, especially those that also have good financial skills uh, amongst yourselves, please study the fiscal uh, uh, stimulus being offered in your countries and make sure uh, that uh, you engage and you point out where we could be missing women. Women tend to be in businesses that are family owned, sole propriety. In some countries, those businesses are not uh, being lined up for 
for benefiting. Women work in a family business without having a proper stake. Uh, that means that when there is money, they may actually end up not benefiting despite the fact that they've given their labor to the business. Women are in, 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 in jobs, in tourism, uh, where there is no proper and, and enforceable contract. And because they have, women generally don't have enough savings, insurance, and all of that, uh, we need to make sure that uh, these are the things that we are fixing. Uh, again, we come in as women activists to talk about this amongst ourselves and to make sure that uh, our advice is that, uh, uh, that we should never be found in this position again. Mm. COVID-19 exposed us how bad it is not to insist on a proper contract. But uh, part of what we are doing as UN Women, working with trade unions, is to insist that uh, we look at the way we are going to re-employ women and bring them back into the economy in a way that will protect them in times of crisis. Mm -hmm. Joy Lobo asks, I understand that in some countries, girls aren't able to attend school whilst menstruating because there are no adequate products, sanitation. Is this the focus of your organization? How can we help in the West? Uh, yes, uh, this is, this is a, a problem uh, in, many, in many countries. Uh, UNICEF again, to, to get ourselves, UNICEF, UNICEF, UNFPA, WHO in some cases, and of course a lot of uh, civil society uh, mm -hmm. support uh, uh, schemes where women actually make sanitary pets that are uh, re reusable, that girls can, can wash, and are able then to provide for girls to have uh, these and they are, can be distributed through uh, schools or through uh, uh, families. And again, uh, from organizations like Girl Guides, where there are a lot of young girls of, of, of that age group, that is also a place where you have a mechanism for distribution. So it is important to identify the people who actually provide the service, who made this. They are always looking uh, for funding for them to expand the service. But also uh, at a policy level, we have engaged government uh, uh, about uh, where possible to provide uh, the pets free. You know, governments provide free condoms uh, and, uh, and not to provide uh, free pets uh, when, if, if you can, if the country can afford it, uh, it denies uh, women and girls uh, that opportunity. We've also made sure uh, that uh, they are also uh, uh, tax-free uh, so that uh, we also make them uh, affordable in, 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 in many countries. And I have to sh say that uh, the response has been good, especially uh, when it comes to, you know, to, to zero rating uh, VAT and, and the, those kinds of tax, uh, tax methods. Mm -hmm. And just one. Pardon? We still have a long way to go. There's a many. There's there are many girls who are not being served. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've probably got time for just one more question. Uh, this one's from Debbie Strouch. Malala's tw 2013 UN speech made the world stand up and take notice to the education of girls in third world countries. Do you feel that was the springboard, the conversation needed, and where are the other Malalas? Uh, yes, it was an important uh, uh, education moment. Malala provided a masterclass. It mm -hmm. uh, also shows that uh, you are never uh, too young to be a leader and a change maker. Uh, she also was uh, amplifying the message that uh, her teachers, probably people in her family who were a positive influence in her life, had role models uh, to her. 
the, and showed the importance uh, of education. Because one thing uh, in uh, uh, Beijing uh, in 1995, uh, uh, which still remains the most comprehensive agreement that has ever been reached about women's equality, was on education and especially on girls' education. Uh, the African women in particular uh, had that as the most important issue on their agenda, the profiling of the issues that affect girls, starting from education, early marriage, uh, issues to do with menstruation. And, because, and it was because of all of those that uh, the concept and the notion of a girl child emerged to show that there are children who have challenges, that's why we need the convention of the child, but there is a girl child issue that needs to be addressed in its own right. So Ma Ma uh, Malala took that a step further and highlighted that even though now we are allowed to go to school, we still have these barriers that still need uh, to be fought. There are many, many Malalas uh, in the world. Uh, this is also for me, as, as we end, something that I just want to leave is just how proud I am of the young women that are coming at us and the things that they are doing. They are fighting climate change. There are many children who are in the front line of uh, climate change who are girls, who are fighting to end child marriage, who are fighting to end uh, FGM, who are fighting to take leadership at school level and whatever they are. And the nice thing about these kids is that they fold their arms and they work. They are not asking for things to be done for them. They are not just making demands. They are actually working and making their own contribution, teaching it as each other to code, working in their schools and demanding to make sure that their schools uh, provide them with the goods that uh, they need at schools. So I think we are in a relatively good space there if you just, you just think about the level of motivation, but we need to support them. Mm. Uh, we also need them to be children at the same time. You, we don't want them to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we have to wrap it up now. I've, I've, I really regret that because <laughs> I feel like we could really talk for so much longer and we're getting some great questions as well. Um, but I have to say goodbye. I have to thank, thank you, you so much for sharing your thoughts, your insights, giving us your time. Um, I think everyone would agree that you've been really inspiring and just a delight to hear from. So you've given us a lot to think about. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I hope this is not the last time uh, our paths cross because I'm sure we, we have a lot to do, at, all we of do. us uh, together in this world. Yeah, absolutely. A huge thank yeah. you to you, Pumzili. A huge thank you once again to Mark Regev and a heartfelt thank you to the Fink family for their generous ongoing contribution to the National Council of Jewish Women Australia, Victoria. I know it means a great deal to the organisation. And last but not least, thank you. Thanks for choosing to spend your very first Tuesday evening in stage four lockdown with us. If you don't already follow NCJWA Vic on Instagram and Facebook, look them up, NCJWA Victoria. And if you're yet to do so, please also feel free to sign up as a member. I know they're always welcomed. NCJWA Vic looks forward to seeing you online or in person again soon. But until then, I'm Rebecca Davis and it's been a pleasure to be your host tonight. Be well, keep safe and good night.